The A's are 165. The nays are 258. The amendment is not adopted. The question is on the committee amendment and the nature of a substitute. Those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, say no. The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted accordingly under the rule. The committee rises. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Speaker, the committee of the Law House uh, on the State of the Union has under consideration H.R. 2681 and pursuant to Rule 1419, uh, reports the bill back to the House with an amendment to the committee of the Law. On the State of the Union reports that the committee has had under consideration the bill H.R. 2681 and pursuant to House Resolution 419 reports the bill back to the House with an amendment adopted in the Committee of the Whole. Under the rule, the previous question is ordered. The question is on adoption of the committee amendment in the nature of a substitute. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The question is on engrossment and third reading of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Third reading. The bill to provide additional time for the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency to issue achievable standards for cement manufacturing facilities and for other purposes. What purpose, the gentleman, gentlelady from California, rise? Mr. Speaker, I have a motion to recommit at the desk. Is the gentlelady opposed to the amendment or opposed to the bill? Mr. Speaker, I can't hear you. House will be in order. The House will be in order. Is the gentlewoman opposed to the bill? Yes. Without a the gentlewoman, it, gentle, gentlewoman is qual qualifies, and the gentlewoman is recognized. The clerk will report the motion. Ms. Capps of California moves to recommit the bill, H.R. 2681, to the Committee on Energy and Commerce with instructions to report the same back to the House forthwith with the following amendment. At the end of the bill, add the following sections. Section 6, protection of infants, children, and pregnant women from toxic and cancer-causing air pollutants. Notwithstanding any other provision of this, of this act, the administrator shall not delay actions pursuant to the rule identified in Section 2B1 of this act to reduce air pollution from cement kilns as defined pursuant to this act, where such cement kilns are within five miles of any school, any daycare center, any playground, or any hospital with a maternity ward or neonatal unit. Section 7, notification to communities with respect to each requirement for a major source facility to implement an air pollution control or emissions reduction that is eliminated by this act, such facilities shall provide notice of such elimination to affected communities not later than 90 days after the date of enactment of this act. House will be in order. Members, please take conversations from the floor. Members in the back of the chamber. Members in the back of the chamber, please cease conversations. Would members in the back of the chamber please cease conversation? Gentlewoman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, there are times when we come to this floor and engage in heated debate. And we've heard some heated debate on this bill. But my final amendment offers us the opportunity to come together and do something extraordinarily important, and that is to protect our children and grandchildren from mercury and other toxic air pollutants. I want to be clear. The passage of this amendment will not prevent the passage of the underlying bill. If it's adopted, my amendment will be incorporated into the bill and the bill will be immediately voted upon. Now, I make no apologies for opposing the bill. But regardless of how one feels about this bill, or even EPA's...
House will be in order. Members in the back of the chamber, please take conversations off the floor. Members on the majority side, in the back of the chamber. Gentlelady is recognized. But regardless of how about one feels about this bill or even EPA cement standards, my amendment would be something that we should all agree upon. And that's because it only does two simple things. First, it says we should have safer air standards on giant cement plants if they're located near schools or hospitals with a maternity ward or a neonatal unit. And that's because these large factories are the third largest source of mercury pollution in the United States. We all know that mercury is extremely dangerous to young children, to nursing mothers, to women of childbearing age. Mercury exposure affects a developing child's ability to walk, to talk, to read, to write, to learn. That's why I think none of us should want to see this in our districts. It's a giant cement plant in Midlothian, Texas. It's spewing mercury and other pollutants into the air right next to J.A. Batovsky Elementary School. But I don't want to just pick on Texas. In California, a giant cement plant in Tehachapi sends far more mercury into the air than any other plant in the state. And it's less than 3,000 feet, 3,000 feet from Monroe High School. That's less than half the distance between where we are today here in the Capitol and the Washington Monument. Mr. Speaker, nothing is more important to us than our children and our grandchildren. Having spent 20 years as a school nurse, I really don't need any reminders of this, but just six months ago, my family was blessed with, again with the birth of a new baby boy. So every time debates about mercury pollution come up, my thoughts immediately go to him and the tens of millions of other children in this country. I know how small and fragile little Oscar is, and I want to make sure that I'm doing everything I can to protect him to make sure the air he breathes and the water he drinks is as safe as it can possibly be. And I'm no different from the mothers, millions of mothers and fathers, grandmothers and grandfathers, aunts and uncles across this country and right in this chamber. We all want the best for our kids, so we must reduce the risk of pollution to them. It's Members in the back of the chamber will please remove their conversations from the floor so that the gentlelady can be heard. The gentlelady is recognized. We all want the best for our kids, so we must reduce the risks of this pollution to them, especially in places that should be safe, like a school. Now, the second part of my simple amendment gives all communities the right to know what pollution is coming from these giant cement factories. Without the sight of ominous clouds billowing from nearby plants, it's easy to assume that we're all relatively safe. But you don't need to live right next door to a giant cement plant to suffer the effects of mercury pollution. And I learned this firsthand when I received test results showing that I have an unsafe level of mercury in my body. And I'm not alone, both in the levels of mercury in my system and by the fact that I didn't know about it until I got tested this past summer. Who in this chamber thinks they have a dangerous level of mercury in their system? Probably no one. But who has actually been tested to know for sure? Probably very few of us. So my final amendment just calls for a little transparency. It makes sure that giant cement plants can't hide the truth about the pollution they're dumping on, into our air each year. It just gives American citizens a right to know what's in their air. That's all. Mr. Speaker, I re respectfully ask that my colleagues consider these two simple propositions. Why should our kids go to schools where mercury is, smoking, is spewing from smokestacks just down the street? And why should any of our constituents be kept in the dark about the pollutants that they're being exposed to? They shouldn't, and we shouldn't stand idly by and let it happen. So today we have the opportunity to speak with one voice. We can vote to protect our children and our grandchildren from mercury and other toxic air pollutants. It's up to us. And so I urge all of us to support this final amendment to the bill, and I yield back. General yields back the balance of her time.
For what purpose does the gentleman from Kentucky rise? To speak in opposition to the uh, gentleman's recognized time in opposition to the motion. The gentleman from Kentucky is, re uh, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, at this time, I would like to yield uh, a minute to whatever from California. I appreciate my colleague yielding, and I'm, I'm rising only because of the comments of the gentlelady who just spoke. Uh, nobody in this chamber has spent more time working on air quality than this member. I was the author of a major bill in California that changed the scene there in terms of polluting the air. During that discussion, we said we can control 97 percent of emissions from smokestacks in a relatively short time if we will. But the real problem is going to be Detroit. If we really want to change that, we've got to change Detroit. Well, if the gentlelady's amendment would follow a logical line, we would indeed insist have, on having an amendment instead that would close down all of Detroit. The problem of mercury is a totally different question uh, than the way this gentlelady presented it. We found problems in the air and found that there was no problem that we thought was there in the first place. Instead of using this for politics, let's try to really solve the problems that are air quality problems and, and let our industry move forward and get our economy to work again. Our legislation, H.R. 2681, provides a balanced approach to a significant problem. These new regulations put out by EPA relating to cement company regulations are unbalanced. We've had testimony after testimony from representatives of the industry that 20 percent of the U.S. cement manufacturing industry will probably close down within two years if these regulations remain in effect. Our legislation is very simple. It simply says to EPA, go back and within 15 months come back with a new regulation, more balanced, give the industry five years to comply. If the administrator wants to give them more, uh, he or she may do so. But this is about protecting jobs as well as about protecting health. As you know, our economy is struggling right now. The testimony shows quite clearly that if we allow these regulations to remain in effect, we're going to lose a lot more jobs. The good news is that once EPA goes back and revisits this issue, they most certainly are going to consider health benefits. They're going to do analysis about health benefits. And I might also say we've heard a lot about mercury. EPA has made it very clear that in the regulation that we're trying to uh, postpone, that they did not even consider the dollar benefit from the reduction in mercury emissions. So from their perspective, the benefits from mercury emissions was insignificant. All of the benefits comes from particulate matter reductions. So I would urge every member of this body to vote no on this motion to recommit and yes on our legislation, H.R. 2681, if we want to save jobs in America, if we want a more balanced approach to environmental regulation. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Without objection, the previous question is ordered. Questions on the motion to recommit. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. No. Any of the chair, the noes have it. Ask for a recorded vote. Recorded vote is requested. Those in support of the request for a recorded vote will rise. Sufficient number having arisen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. Pursuant to Clause 9 of Rule 20, the chair will reduce to five minutes the minimum time of any electronic vote on the, pa on the question of passage. This is a 15-minute vote. The House begins to wrap up work on a bill that would delay Environmental Protection Agency regulation of air emissions from cement plants. This is the motion to recommit, a last chance to change the bill. Final passage is next, and later in the House they will continue work, resume work, on a similar measure, one dealing with emission rules for industrial boilers and incinerators. It's a 15-minute vote on the House floor. The final passage vote will be a five-minute vote. Just a short while ago in the U.S. Senate, the uh, Senate voted, voted cloture to move forward to limit debate on the uh, China currency bill, and that vote was 62 in favor, 38 opposed. You can follow that on C-SPAN 2.
on cspan.org you can follow the president he's holding a news conference now and we are carrying that live he has said he will meet with the senate democrats later today the white house saying that majority leader harry reid senators dick durbin and chuck schumer will attend the meeting this afternoon at 5:30 eastern and while this 15-minute uh, vote continues we're going to take you back to the senate banking committee to hear from treasury secretary timothy geithner and we've been very careful not to uh, not to estimate the number of Americans could be reached by this, because as you've seen, we dramatically overestimated at the beginning of this, all our housing programs, the number of people we could reasonably reach who could qualify and be eligible. So we'll be cautious. But my, basic, my sense is, based on what I've seen and what he's told us, it's going to make it, it's meaningful enough to make a difference. Is there, a, is there any sense to using uh, soft seconds for the balance that is underwater as a way to create loans that could re-enter the, uh, the marketplace? Uh, uh, that is one of the issues that uh, they're looking at trying to fix because that's one of the things that stands in the way of uh, allowing more people to take advantage of lower rates. But I can't tell you today, I don't know yet, uh, to what extent they feel they have a fix to that. Yeah. That's way, yeah, it's one way of, uh, uh, rather than, uh, uh, one possibility is certainly taking the whole, uh, saying refinance the whole thing regardless of the amount you're underwater, and that's easier and simpler, but. Well, what, what the, yeah, that's true, but, but they're looking at a range of things, and, and you'll see more details in a couple weeks. Okay, I look forward to that. And then, uh, finally, in terms of uh, rules related to uh, implementing the Volcker rule, uh, the, certainly the, the the goal is to say that uh, commercial banks are in the business of making loans to businesses and families, that that's extremely important. If you want to be a, a hedge fund, uh, become a hedge fund, uh, but not uh, mix the two uh, to the detriment or the increase in systemic risk. Uh, there is some concern about out there in, in regards to whether the rules are going to have substantial loopholes. Is this something that you're, you're in, engaged in, and, and can, I, can, I, can I sleep well knowing we'll have a, 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 a clear distinction? I think you can, uh, and I should say, and I think you, you're aware of this, there's already been a very substantial change across that industry, uh, moving away from dedicated uh, internal uh, hedge funds, not to use the pejorative, um, in anticipation of the rule. But you're going to see the agencies, uh, I think this week and next, lay out detailed proposals. Those, those will go out for comment. Everybody will have a chance to look at where the balance is. They're going to ask some questions, too, about issues we haven't resolved yet. And so we'll have a chance at that point to make sure we get the balance right. But I'm, I'm very confident this is going to, this is going to meet the objectives uh, of the legislation. I think that the, uh, the plans on compensation for market making trades is very, very helpful because it creates a very a huge distinction uh, between uh, one business and the other. Thank you very much. Thank you. There are a couple other members who uh, tell us they are coming back. And in the meantime, um, the, the claim has been made that uh, it's a center for the FSOC to set aside a final CFPB rule is a quite pretty high threshold. Would you please explain the appropriateness of the standard? Well, uh, as one of the checks and balances exists in the law, and as I said, I think that combined with the others make it a pretty strong set of checks and balances. I, I know that some members up here would like to alter them, but that specific provision allows the, con the council to, in effect, block or overrule a judgment by the Bureau. If it's inconsistent with safety and soundness, uh, I think that's the basic standard. And as I said, that's, that's quite unique. Um, safeguard check and balance, a very strong check and balance, not the only one. And uh, as I discussed earlier with Senator Corker, I think the balance is, is pretty strong. Last year, the SEC adopted new rules to strengthen money market funds. And last October, the President's Working Group recommended several possible reforms to reduce the potential systemic risk of money market funds. Do you and the F, um, FSOC members agree that further reforms are needed to make money market funds more resilient and less susceptible to runs? What risks are we currently facing? Uh, the chairman of the SEC agrees with that, that more reforms are necessary. And the, I think the broad sense of the council, and I share this, is that she's right. Uh, she is examining a range of ideas 
Some of those um, have encouraged, have elicited a lot of opposition and concern. Some of them more support. They're working through those. But I, uh, my sense is, is that although we have more work to do, we've, we've made quite a lot of progress. Uh, and we want to build on that progress, do so carefully. And, and I, think the, I think the chairwoman of the SEC is, is um, supportive of a careful, balanced look at further reforms to make, the, as you said, the FOS funds more resilient. In the, the, in the FSOC annual report, you note that the U.S. is leading a global effort to develop minimum standards for margin on swaps. Could you provide us an update on the progress of international coordination to harmonize swap rules in a way that both reduces systemic risk and promotes U.S. competitiveness? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, we have three decades of experience with uh, global capital standards. We're trying to make those better. Uh, no precedent, no previous attempt to make sure we have in place common rules on margin around the world for derivatives. So what we've proposed is a major international effort to establish those. We've formed a special uh, international task force that is led by uh, the Federal Reserve, I believe, or led jointly by the Federal Reserve that brings together central banks, bank supervisors, market regulators together to try to design a common framework that will match what we're doing in the United States. We're at the early stage of that process, but my sense from talking to the European officials and those in Asia, the UK officials, that there's very broad support for that and they share our interest in making sure there's a global level playing field in that area. Senator Shelby, do you, I do. you have Thank additional questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a few. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Secretary, I want to uh, uh, get, uh, try to answer what you, you made a pitch for the nominee, uh, former Attorney General, uh, to be confirmed. Uh, Forty-four of us have sent a letter to, you're very familiar with to the President. And, and I think uh, and, to me, too. If I could finish. Yeah. And we haven't heard one word about that, asking for some modifications to this. It's not the nominee. I think the nominee, as far as I know, is, is probably a, a, a well-qualified, you know, very honorable, very smart man. But uh, we're, we're waiting for that dialogue, and I hope we hear from you. But short of that, I think the nominee's not going anywhere. So, but I wanted to answer that. Go ahead, sir. Well, we, we, I understand your position, and we've received that message. You've been very clear about it, and you had a pretty powerful show of strength. Uh, but I was just encouraging you to reconsider, uh, because I think that... Um, well, we'd hope you'd reconsider, you and the President, uh, uh, changing uh, three modest things in the Dodd-Frank bill. And if you do, I'm sure that we'll have a good piece of legislation, at least a better piece, and uh, we'll go from there. But short of that, uh, I don't believe that we are moving that nomination. No, I'm, I'm always optimistic. I do think the three things you suggested... Don't get optimistic on that. I would say the, uh, the three things you suggested, uh, Senator, in combination, uh -huh. I think would be a significant weakening of the, of the, of the Bureau. Well, we don't think so. We think it would strengthen the Bureau. But, you know, we have a difference of opinion. But I thought I'd answer that. I have a few questions. I just what have comes one. around goes around. Absolutely. And that's why we will uh, plan on coming around, you know. Uh, Secretary Geithner, the Bank of England governor, you know, Mervyn King, as well as some prominent academic uh, economists have said that Basel III capital standards they believe are insufficient to prevent another crisis. Do you agree with them or, or, or do you have second thoughts? I do, I, I do not. Uh, I, I've thought myself that Basel III, the strengthening of capital standards, was positive. The, the framework that we call Basel III is a dramatic increase in the basic conservatism of the capital regime in the United States and around the world, a substantial increase in capital relative to what was required before the crisis, combined with the liquidity provisions in place too, creates better protections. Now, uh, just one quick qualification. We have proposed uh, that the largest institutions hold, and this was required by the legislation too, hold an additional buffer of capital reflecting the greater risks they pose to uh -huh. the system. And our judgment is the combination of those two things. Uh, as long as you phase them in, you, know, you want to phase them in carefully over time, 
But but uh, not too much time, is it? I mean, not 25 no, years. No, you don't want to wait too long. Okay. Uh, but uh, you don't want to you don't want people uh, building capital too much too quickly or having to sell assets to meet those requirements too quickly when the recovery is still trying to get. Momentum. But they got to get on the right road, and you? they are. And and U.S. firms are very very far along to meeting those new standards. Do you have uh, uh, confidence that the European banks and the regulators there will? will comply with Basel III, the spirit as, as well as the letter of it? Well, we're going to do everything we can to make sure they do, of course. And, uh, and as I said, we have the time to try to make sure we're confident that's going to happen because these rules only start to bite over the next uh, several years. Uh -huh. And so we're working very hard to make sure we have better protections in place. But Secretary, do you know of any financial institution, you've been around a while, that has had has been adequately, in other words, I don't say adequately, well capitalized and have liquidity that has failed. Now that's like a that's a very interesting question. Uh, um, I think that in a uh, in a really systemic financial crisis, uh, just to think back to the experience of this country in 2008, for example, uh, certainly it was the case from the Great Depression and other examples of this stuff. Mm -hmm. You can have a situation when even very well capitalized financial institutions are subject to acute pressure. In some sense, that's the best way of thinking of your definition of what's a systemic crisis. But if they have liquidity, doesn't that help? It does help. But, uh, you know, we're, this is an interesting conversation, but uh, you can't, it, it's not sensible to try to force the system to hold capital and reserves that would cover any foreseeable oh, yeah. imaginable risk or shock. Well, that makes no sense. Uh, exactly. So in a really systemic financial crisis, mm -hmm. even the strong uh, will be affected by the pressures you see more broadly. Sure. Uh, this week... Uh, but but that just pretty clear, that, that's no comment on the present. Uh, you know, we're in, uh, I think, you know, as I said, and if you look at capital liquidity, classic measures, um, in a, in a really strong relative position. This week, uh, earlier this week, the Bank of America, I guess it's our largest bank, I know it is in deposits, so forth, announced that it would charge a monthly fee to consumers, I guess for credit cards. When asked about the fee, the president stated, as I understand it, that the banks do not have a right to get a certain amount of profit. How much, Mr. Secretary, how much profit should the government allow a bank to make and does the president's comments mean that this administration supports government mandated price controls on financial products? I mean, this is, or, or is, he, is that taken out of context what he said, or is that just political rhetoric? Uh, the president does not believe that we get to determine how profitable individual financial institutions are other companies across the country. That's not the system we believe in, or we... The market should determine a lot of that, should it? It should, of course. But uh, what we do believe, though, is that you want to have a system of oversight of consumer uh -huh. protection where uh, consumers have the ability to understand what they're being charged for financial services, what they're being charged to borrow. And part of what we're trying to do is encourage much more transparency and clarity so that consumers are a little less vulnerable to being taken advantage of. So the consumer can make the decision and not a bureaucrat, right? That's exactly right. Okay. Uh, now, there are, now there are things that government officials have to do, though. It's our responsibility to do. Uh, but the basic strategy we've adopted, the president supported, and the CFPB is designed to establish, puts overwhelming uh, burden on better transparency and disclosure as a way to make sure consumers have the better chance to protect themselves. But you're basically saying this administration is, is not in any way coming out for any type of wage and price controls of any kind? Uh, no. Okay. Or yes, I'm saying we are yeah. not. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, the uh, Council's annual report that we've been talking about all morning, uh, efforts to coordinate Dodd-Frank implementation, it goes across a number of agencies, as you well know. Uh, the CFTC and the SEC have consistently, a lot of people believe, have failed to harmonize some of the substance and the time frame of their Dodd-Frank rules. Uh, what's the council, has the council in, been involved in this, trying to, and, and are, they, are they making any success here in improving the coordination of the SEC and the CFTC? I think that's important. 
that you be I, drinking out of the same cup, so to speak. I completely agree with you, although um, Congress did leave in place mm -hmm. uh, this complicated set of independent agencies mm -hmm. with independent statutory requirements. Our basic approach has been to say that as you meet those requirements, we'd like you to do so in a way that is as closely aligned as the law permits. Mm -hmm. Where the law permits you to be aligned, you should be aligned, because if you're not, all you're going to do is uh, leave a complicated system with big distortions, opportunities for arbitrage gaps. And that matters for us here, but it also makes it harder for us to get the world to come to a more level playing field. If we're different places, it's harder to get the world to come to mm -hmm. a sensible place. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Bridger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I wanted to focus in my questions on uh, the housing finance agencies and market and the need to bring reform there, including a return of the private capital and the private market into that now very um, government-dominated uh, sector. My concern for a while, including all through the Dodd-Frank discussion, is that that was put on the side with the promise that we'll get to that, we'll get to that next year. Well, it's now next year, and, and I don't particularly see us getting to it. Now, I, I do know um, the FSOC report includes the statement that um, the member agencies need to strengthen the system, quote, which includes developing a framework for the return of private capital to the system, close quote. What does that mean exactly, and what's the timetable for concrete action? Uh, I just want to uh, start with one observation, which is that Congress did enact a uh, fundamental change to the basic framework of oversight of the GSEs and the home loan bank system in uh, September of 08, ahead of Dodd-Frank. But you're right uh, that with that foundation, which didn't solve all our problems, uh, Dodd-Frank did not go further and lay out this fundamental challenge of fixing the broader housing finance system. That's still ahead of us. So wh what, are, what are we trying to do? Uh, we want to set up a framework where private capital, private investors, private, the private system plays the more dominant role in housing finance once again, and that we gradually phase down the government's role to a more limited, more targeted, uh, more sensible role. For that to happen, we need to have uh, a clearer set of rules in place across the securitization markets clarity on the amount of capital you have to hold against a mortgage loan if you're a private institution. And we need to gradually wind down the exceptional measures, ex exceptional expansion of the Fannie and Freddie and the FHA's rule that happened in the crisis as private capital withdrew. Uh, as we, we laid out Both a the ayes of 176, the nays are 247, less than majority voting in the affirmative. The motion is not agreed to. Questions on passage of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. And the chair, the ayes have it. Requested vote. Recorded vote, please. Recorded vote is requested. Those in support of the request for recorded vote will rise. Sufficient number having arisen. Recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a five-minute vote. This is final passage on a bill that would prevent the EPA uh, specific regulations and rules on air emissions from cement plants. It's a five-minute vote. Still to come, though, is more debate on a similar measure, one that would block the EPA from implementing rules on emissions of mercury and other toxic air pollutants from industrial boilers and incinerators.
On this vote, the ayes are 262, the nays are 161. The bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Mr. Gentleman from Illinois. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Clause 2 of Rule 9, I rise to give notice of my intent to raise a question of the privileges of the House. The form of the resolution is as follows. Whereas, on October 2, 2011, Mr. Speaker, the House is not in order. Gentleman's correct. House will be in order. Gentleman from Illinois. Whereas, on October the 2nd, 2011, the Washington Post reported a story called, and I quote, Rick Perry and a word set on stone, unquote. Whereas, upon reading that story, the vast majority of the people of the United States were morally outraged. Whereas, most of the facts in this resolution come from that Washington Post story. Whereas, Governor Rick Perry has described a childhood in Haskell County in Pank Creek, Texas, as the centered on Boy Scouts, school, and church. Whereas Texas Governor Rick Perry is from West Texas and was originally a Southern Democrat, often known as a Dixiecrat, who switched parties in the late 1980s to become a Republican and is currently a leading Republican presidential candidate. Whereas ranchers who once grazed cattle on the 1,070-acre parcel in Throckmorton County on the Clear Fork of the Brazos River near where Governor Perry was raised in Pank Creek, Texas, it has become a hunting ground that was called by the name, and I quote, Niggerhead, well before Governor Perry and his father Ray began hunting there in the early 1980s, even though there is no definitive account of when the rock first appeared on the property. Whereas the use of the term Niggerhead to describe a hunting retreat is morally offensive. Whereas Ronnie Brooks, a local resident who guided a few turkey shoots for Governor Perry between 1985 and 1990, said he holds Governor Perry, and I quote, in the highest esteem, unquote, but said that of this rock at the camp, quote, it kind of offended me truthfully, unquote. Whereas Haskell County Judge David Davis, sitting in his courtroom and looking at a window there, said the word was, quote, like those vertical blinds, it's just what it was called. There was no significance other than a hunting deal, unquote. In other words, the judge was morally vaucous. Whereas the name of this particular parcel did not change for years and for many remained the same after it became associated with Rick Perry, first as a private citizen, then as a state official, and finally as Texas governor. Whereas some local residents still call it by the morally repugnant name Niggerhead. Whereas recently as this summer, a slab-like rock lying flat, portions of the name still faintly visible beneath a coat of white paint, remained by the gate entrance to the camp. Whereas asked last week about the name, Governor Perry said on the rock is an offensive name that has no place in the modern world, implying that it may have been okay and had an appropriate place in that community when he was growing up. Whereas Mary Lou Yeldell has lived in Haskell County, Texas, for 70 years and recalls the racism she feels in the 1950s and 60s in West Texas when being called an offensive name like whites greeting blacks with quote morning nigger was like a broken record. Whereas Throckmorton County where the hunting camp is located near Haskell County was for years considered a virtual no-go zone for African Americans because of old stories told by locals about the lynching of African American men there. Whereas Haskell County began observing Martin Luther King Jr.'s day, his birthday celebration, just two years ago, according to a county commissioner in Haskell County. Whereas Governor Perry grew up in a segregated, area, a segregated era whose history has defined and complicated the careers of many Southern politicians. Whereas Governor Perry has spoken often about how his upbringing in his sparsely populated farming community influenced his conservatism. Whereas Governor Perry says he mentioned the offensive word on the rock to his parents shortly after they signed the lease and he had visited the property and they rather immediately painted over the word during the next July 4th holiday. But seven people interviewed by the Washington Post said they still saw the word on the rock at various points during the years that the Perry family was associated with the property through his family, partners, or a signature on a lease. 
whereas another local resident who visited the property with Governor Perry and the legislators he brought there to go hunting recalled seeing the rock and the name clearly visible. Whereas how, when, or whether Governor Perry dealt with it when he was using the property isn't clear and adds a dimension to the emerging biography of Governor Perry who quickly moved in the top tier of Republican presidential candidates when he entered the race in August. And whereas Herman Cain is the only Republican presidential candidate to criticize Governor Rick Perry for being insensitive when the word was not immediately condemned, but we would remind Herman Cain that the word is insensitive, it is also offensive. Now therefore it be resolved. Resolved that the House of Representatives call on Governor Rick Perry to apologize for not immediately doing away with the rock that contained the word niggerhead at the entrance of a ranch he was leasing on and which he was taking friends, colleagues, and supporters to hunt. It calls on Governor Rick Perry's presidential rivals, who've not yet made strong statements of outrage over the rock that contained the word, to do so. It calls upon Governor Rick Perry to condemn the use of this word as being totally offensive and inappropriate at any time and at any place in United States history. And lastly, it calls upon Governor Rick Perry to list the names of all lawmakers, friends, and financial supporters he took with him on his hunting trips to Niggerhead. Under Rule 9, of, under rule nine a resolution offered by, from the floor by a member other than the majority leader or the minority leader as, is, as a question of privileges of the House has immediate precedence only at a time designated by the chair within two legislative days after the resolution is properly noticed. Pending that designation, the form of the resolution noticed by the gentleman from Illinois will appear in the record at this point. The chair will not at this point determine whether the resolution constitutes a question of privilege. That determination will be made at the time designated for consideration of the resolution. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. We need somebody up here. Pursuant to House Resolution 419 and Rule 18, the Chair declares the House and the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for further consideration of H.R. 2250. Will the gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Simpson, kindly take the Chair? House and the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for the further consideration further consideration of H.R. 2250, which the clerk will report by title. A bill to provide additional time for the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency to issue achievable standards for industrial, commercial, and institutional boilers, process heaters, and incinerators, and for other purposes. When the Committee of the Whole House rose earlier today, pursuant to House Resolution 419, all time for general debate had expired. Pursuant to the rule, the amendment in the nature of a substitute printed in the bill shall be considered as an original bill for the purposes of amendment under the five-minute rule and shall be considered read. No amendment, in the committee of the, no amendment to the committee amendment in the nature of a substitute shall be in order except those received for printing in the portion of the congressional res record designated for that purpose in a daily, daily issue dated October 4, 2011 or earlier and accept, and accept pro forma amendments for the purposes of debate. 
Each amendment sh so received may be offered only by the member who caused it to be printed or a designee and shall be considered as read if printed. For what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment preprinted in the record as amendment number 9 to H.R. 2250. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number 9, printed in the congressional record, offered by Mr. Waxman of California. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, yesterday Republicans told us they aren't opposed to clean air, but we just can't afford it right now. And as their bills have no deadline for ever cleaning up toxic air pollution from these sources, it appears that they don't think we can ever afford clean air, even in the future. The truth is, we can't afford to wait for clean air any longer. And here's why. Mercury is a potent neurotoxin. Numerous scientific studies from around the world show that babies and children who are exposed to mercury may suffer damage to their developing nervous systems, hurting their ability to think, learn, and speak. EPA has estimated that about 7% of women of childbearing age are exposed to mercury at a level capable of causing adverse effects in the developing fetus. That may not sound like a big number, but that translates into thousands and thousands of children who may never reach their full potential. Toxic pollution can have tragic consequences. That's why Republicans and Democrats alike voted in 1990 to strengthen the Clean Air Act to require dozens of industry sectors to install modern pollution controls on their facilities. And since then, EPA has set emission standards for more than 100 different categories of industrial sources. The standards simply require facilities to use pollution controls that others in their industry are already using. They are based on maximum achievable control technology. EPA's approach has been successful. Emissions standards for these industrial sources have reduced emissions of carcinogens mercury and other highly toxic chemicals by 1.7 million tons each year. But a few major industrial sources so far have escaped regulation and the Republicans appear to be on a mission to help them continue to evade emissions limits on toxic air pollution. Coal-fired power plants are one major industrial source of hazardous air pollutants. In fact, they are the largest U.S. source of airborne mercury pollution. But just a couple of weeks ago, the Republicans passed the TRAIN Act to nullify EPA's rules to cut toxic air pollution from those sources. Yesterday, we debated whether or not cement kilns, another major, major source of mercury, should have to clean up. The Republicans said no. And today, we are talking about incinerators and dirty boilers at industrial facilities across the country, including chemical plants, refineries, and large manufacturing facilities. H.R. 2250 nullifies EPA's rules to, clean, to, rules to clean up toxic air pollution from these sources and requires EPA to issue new rules using confusing, confusing and unworkable criteria. These long overdue public health protections will be delayed for years. That's unacceptable for the people who live near a solid waste incinerator or a chemical plant using a dirty boiler. These communities already have been waiting for more than a decade for EPA to clean up these facilities. My amendment is straightforward. It states that EPA can continue to require an incinerator or facility using a dirty boiler to clean up its toxic air pollution if that facility is emitting mercury or other toxic pollutants that are damaging infants' developing brains. This amendment simply, simply uh, clarifies our choice. Allow polluters to continue to harm infants and children on the one hand, which is what the Republicans would allow, or require facilities that are actually harming our kids to reduce their pollution. I urge my colleagues to so support this amendment and protect our children's future. I know we hear a lot about jobs and we hear a lot about the economy. Our economy will not recover 
if our children's minds are not allowed to fully develop, if we don't have a, a population of young people that can be born healthy, can get educated, can learn, and produce a good life for themselves, their families, and for their families, and for our nation's economy. So please support this amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. What purpose the gentleman from Kentucky rise? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to the amendment. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Our legislation 2250 does not leave the American people with the choice of having to have unregulated air, polluted air that creates horrible health consequences. Our legislation is a balanced approach that simply says we think that Congress has a responsibility to review regulations that where the American people have told us in hearings that they have great difficulty in complying. In some instances, they are unable to comply, and that as a result, jobs will be lost. Sometimes listening to the debate, it sounds like that we have the most polluted air in the world. I would note that EPA reported that since 1990, nationwide air quality has improved significantly for the six common air pollutants. For example, ozone pollution has been lowered by 14 percent, coarse particulate matter dust by 31 percent, lead by 78 percent, nitrogen dioxide by 35 percent, <coughs> carbon monoxide by 68 percent, sulfur dioxide by 59 percent. So we have a very clean air standard today, and our legislation is not in any way going to change any of the health protections. We simply are asking, because of the concerns expressed by many people around the country, many industries around the country, that EPA should go back, within 15 months issue, promulgate a new rule, within five years give the industry that much time to comply if the EPA administrator thinks they need more time uh, then she or he may do that but is not required to do so so our position is that this is a balanced approach particularly at this vulnerable time in our economy when our unemployment rate is high that we can protect jobs we can help stimulate the economy and we can also protect health without endangering our young people so for that reason uh, I would oppose the amendment and ask members to uh, uh, to oppose this amendment I yield back balance my time gentlelady from California for what first she writes gentlelady is recognized for five minutes Mr. Speaker, I rise in, in strong support of this amendment. The bill before us nullifies EPA's rules to require industrial boilers and incinerators to reduce their emissions of toxic mercury and other toxic pollutants. The bill removes legal deadlines for pollution controls to be installed, fundamentally weakening the Clean Air Act and allowing years or decades of continued toxic air pollution. Mr. Speaker, mercury is a potent neurotoxin. According to the California Department of Toxic Substances Control, human exposure to organic mercury can result in long-lasting health effects, especially if it occurs during fetal development. In addition, scientists have linked mercury poisoning to nervous system, kidney, and liver damage and impaired childhood development. Nervous system disorders can include impaired vision, speech, hearing, and coordination. In other words, babies born to women exposed to mercury during pregnancy can suffer from a range of developmental and neurological problems, including delays in speaking and difficulties in learning. Children suffering from the chronic effects of mercury exposure may reach, never reach their full potential. This clearly has a profound impact on the affected children and their families, and it also has a long-term societal impact. In 1990, Congress amended the Clean Air Act on a bipartisan basis 
to reduce emissions of mercury and other toxic pollutants from a range of industrial sources, including boilers and incinerators. Boilers and incinerators are one of the largest sources of airborne mercury pollution in the United States. For far too long, they have been allowed to pollute without installing modern technology to reduce their emissions. This is of particular concern for women who are pregnant, may become pregnant, or who are nursing. Mercury exposure in the womb can adversely affect the developing brain and nervous system. This can lead to problems with a child's cognitive thinking, memory, attention, language, and fine motor skills. As of 2008, 50 states, one U.S. territory, and three tribes have issued advisories for mercury. Earlier this year, EPA finalized standards to cut emissions of mercury and other toxic air pollutions from boilers and incinerators. These rules were more than a decade late. EPA is in the process of reconsidering those rules and plans to finalize the revised rules by next April. Once finalized, EPA's rules for boilers and incinerators will cut mercury pollution from these sources. The Republican leadership wants to nullify these rules. They have also passed legislation to nullify rules to clean up mercury pollution from cement plants, and they have passed legislation to nullify rules to clean up mercury pollution from dirty coal-fired power plants, the largest U.S. source of mercury pollution to the air. This is unacceptable for public health. People living near these polluting facilities have waited far too long for them to clean up their pollution. They shouldn't have to wait any longer. This amendment is straightforward. It states that the bill does not stop EPA from taking action to clean up toxic air pollution from an industrial boiler or incinerator if that facility is emitting mercury or other toxic pollutants that are damaging babies, developing brains. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. I yield back the balance of my time.